Good afternoon. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name's Nicola Kemp and I'm Editorial Director of Creative Brief. And it is my pleasure to host today's Garrity UK Jury Insight Panel. I have two incredible judges and industry leaders here with me today who got together just a few days ago at the School of Communication Arts in sunny Brixton to view, debate and discuss a really vast range of work. Now, the lens that that work was viewed through was unique as the Garrity Awards redefine the standard to which advertising is held and how, as an industry, we benchmark creativity. Named after Francis Garrity, the copywriter who coined the slogan, A Diamond is Forever, the awards mark the first time that juries have been brought together to select the best in advertising, all advertising, not just advertising aimed at women through the female lens. But that lens is at risk of being smashed in an industry which is still failing to retain female talent. So what should we be doing differently? What trends can we learn from? And how can we stay creative in an always on world? So with me today, I have two wonderful women to delve into those themes. Jessica Tamzidge is a UK CEO at Dentsu Creative. She's actually just landed in her new role, and she's at the forefront of a fresh wave of female leaders driving forward progressive creativity. And she was previously Chief Client Officer at McCann UK and Europe. And Becky Ball is Chief Creative Strategy Director at Edelman, where she sits at the intersection of strategy, creativity, and culture. She works on technology and innovation and campaigns that live and die by how they earn. And Becky has led campaigns for some of the world's largest technology and engineering brands. Hi. Hello. Thanks for having us, Nikki. Thanks for having us. Pleasure to be here. So... I'd love to just kick off by talking about the judging process that we had and really the power of seeing the work through a different lens, because it's a very different energy, actually, in a judging room when it's an all-female um, uh, team of judges, really. So, so Jess, I'd love to get your view, um, because sometimes it feels like we're not moving fast enough when it comes to shifting the lens. I mean, do you think the creative industries are doing enough to widen the lens? So I think it always starts with the work. Look at the work to go, where are we at? Whether that's representation within the agencies making the work, the way that we're researching, talking to our audiences, trying to understand what stories we should be representing. The proof is always in the pudding. And so Becky and I both, I think, felt sitting in the room, there was some really progressive work in there, really different shaped solutions that weren't just trying to talk to women with women on stages, with women microphones talking about women things. They were just really enlightened conversations about brands, their role in society. There was a lot of very purposeful work in there. But so, so the debate in the room ended up being as much about, gosh, where did this start as a creative process? What kind of problem was this even trying to solve? Rather than do I feel as a woman listened to and understood by this particular product or piece of communication? So that for me was really heartening. I think you can't, probably answer that question without acknowledging some stuff you've talked about Nikki, you both here and more broadly around where our industry is at and it's helpful because we've had the audit census very recently and there are still some disappointing figures in there we've got you know 43 percent of women in c-suite roles uh with you know we should be over 50 percent 29% of women still believe that gender is, is hindering their career. I mean, you nodded to the fact that I'm part of hopefully a new wave of female leadership and that balance within my own organisation. You've got 62% of uh, our workforce is women and 52% of them in leadership, so we're protecting that. But the balance still isn't there. We're still losing women as you go up the rack. So those final arbiters of craft and decision-making over even which brands agencies pitch for isn't necessarily representative of those audiences we want to serve. And then I think if I come back to the work on more broadly than even what we saw in the room with Garrity, we still do have some problematic um, representation issues going on. So you've got, um, you know, still those slightly domestic tropes of women playing mum roll, thumbs up, she's covered in baking powder, that's fine because she's basically a superhero. And I'd probably draw the analogy of how, maybe this is too stark, but of how the disabled community is represented for a really long time as sort of superheroes that can do it all until 
work like we are 15 came along when just people trying to do normal things. So it's still a bit of that at one end of the extreme um, going on. Um, I won't name the femme care brand that we saw with a sort of non-white woman uh, on her period in a leotard doing some you know casual ice skating. So there are some unhelpful stories still being told, but I think we're moving in the right question, right direction, and we're having the right uncomfortable conversations. Right. That's, That's, really, That's really interesting. And and Becky bringing you in here, that there, there were some examples of work, and, and especially when you think that people are submitting that, thinking that that is best in class. Um, there's still a way to go. And it, as Jess explains, you know, that those unhelpful stories, maybe there's a red thread between those unhelpful stories and who's at the top of those organizations making those big decisions. Um, what do you see happening with the work and, and through this lens? And what do you think it means both for the work, but also for the creative industry more broadly, because particularly thinking about agencies entering the Garrity Awards for Agency of the Year, I love the idea of those discussions they're having behind the scenes in their PR and marketing departments going, this is judged by a room full of female creative leaders. I think that's a really, just just that conversation is a different type of conversation to be having. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as uh, Jessica commented on, it was so interesting to see the diversity of work. We weren't just talking about sort of shrink it, pink it, <laughs> um, you know, like stuff that was deliberately aimed at specifically women as a buying audience. It was, um, yeah, it was just a real diversity of, of work that was shown across across the whole um, uh, facets uh, of the categories that we were able to judge. Um, but I think, I guess when we're talking about the lens and sort of what happens when we get it right, what happens when we're sort of, you know, um, uh, involving women in that in that process by thinking through this lens of, of the female gaze, I guess there are so many things that happen to the work, but also in a in the agency environment, I suppose. You know, we, we obviously, whether you believe it's nature or, you know, whether it's a skill women are socially conditioned to adopt, emotional intelligence is, you know, the hallmark of working with female, female creatives. And I think women consistently score, you know, more highly in emotional intelligence kind of tests across the board. But, you know, that ability to place ourselves in the audience's shoes, to read the unwritten code, that are going on in those environments I think that just allows you to create more this more emotionally resonant work um, and find unexpected ways in like we've seen those tropes we've seen those problematic narratives that Jessica was talking about um, but I think when you get more diversity in the lens that you're sort of applying to the work you get those ahas of relatability you know you get those unexpected prompts um, that the best ads the best campaigns all have right we all get to see ourselves um, in those new lights when they're able to, to present those to us um, and obviously you know viability is the other massive factor like even though women are still you know the primary buying audience for an entire household and the primary caregivers for children for elderly people like it's still astonishing and some of the stats that Jessica was talking about from that all-in um, survey that you know if if women are responsible for sort of 75 80 percent of discretionary spending and yet we're only sort of 40 percent 50 percent of senior decision making there's there's some real questions that need to be had at that level about sort of where where those choices are made and you know uh, I think when we get it right, that viability piece really comes in because we're talking to the people that are making those purchasing decisions. We're talking about people that are inculcating purchasing decisions in kids, in their partners, in their sphere of influence. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um, and then obviously, lastly, you get more creative work. Like we've we've seen the ideas men have had <laughs> for the last <laughs> many decades uh, you know um, uh, when when the male lens is the default, you know, you get default ideas I think a lot of the time we need to diversify that viewpoint in order to and pass the mic in order to get past those sort of obvious insights those obvious um jumping off points and and get to get to more insightful and creative work that's such an interesting point about emotional intelligence as well because particularly thinking about all the themes that we saw watching all that brilliant work, but just also this moment in time that we're in at the moment, like we, we, we're all transitioning in different ways, whether it's hybrid working, the cost of living crisis, you know, there is a universal um, belief that the world is a bit of a mess right now. And, and that can be a really positive thing in some ways because you can shake things up and do things differently. Um, so I'd love to talk about 
some of the trends that we um, saw in the work. And Jess, I'd love to kick off with purpose because there's, I, I mean, there's a real sort of negative narrative in the industry around purpose, quite a lot of purpose fatigue, but we're really beginning to see a more meaningful approach to purpose from brands, brands really addressing the climate crisis. How far do you think we have to go on this journey? And, and how do we not get cynical about it before we've really got going? There's been a lot of conversation about this. I think I'm the first person to go, why would you ever a neck on a brand, a business, a person trying to do something good in the world? It's about flip the time. Um, I think it's it's about credibility and walking the walk and all of that stuff. So no matter what brand you're on the conversation, we for a very long time drawn brand onion, brand onions and pyramids and ladders with kind of abstract language at the top around, don't worry about it, this chocolate bar actually exists to probably save your life and the universes. But I think now the, the transparency that consumers are demanding of brands means that you have to have some substance behind that. And I think where the cynicism creeps in is if that starts with storytelling and shiny veneers of marketing before it starts with the substance of what brands are actually doing. Um, and if you, if you, you know, there's so many facets of purpose, but if you take sustainability as an area, for example, I've, uh, I was lucky enough to do a course in sustainability with media and marketing comms recently. And it's mad when you look at the actual journey all organizations have to go on is to be reduce their carbon footprint, re reduce the bad they're doing in the world. And then they've got to find a way to, to, to commit to more positive change, you know, so looking at after the communities that they serve or are a part of their supply chains, actively finding ways to give back and address uh, change for good. But brands quite often, or businesses, can be at risk of sometimes jumping straight to that top bit of going, don't worry about it, we've got this lovely, amazing NPD that we've just launched that happens to be biodegradable. What about the rest of it, man? <laughs> um, and so I think there's a really healthy lens which we as experts and practitioners no longer need to be the ones that hold that because consumers are doing that, right? You know, it takes two seconds on Twitter for Brewdog to do a thing. You're like, well, what about your actual people and your workforce? Mm. So I think we're all holding organizations to, to healthy account. Um, I also think that there's some really brilliant examples coming out of our industry of more purposeful work. And we we definitely saw that Becky when Becky's talking about the, the diversity of shapes of work. Load of the debates we were having was is this an agency telling the story about something a business has done? Is this truly, you know, because it was fundamentally changing business models? You know, there was the the example of drains, uh, innovation around drain technology and how you can use this differently to help with flooding. Um I think ever since almost the peanut X example of the pineapple leather that I'm just still so obsessed with, where you go, oh my God, this is what the, the shape of, and scale of impact work from our industry can have. It's it's really quite, um, it instills a lot of pride and hope actually in how creativity can solve much bigger things and don't just have to start with the shiny, you know, headline on a, on a story that we're going to tell. Um, so really, you know, convoluted answer, but I think there is huge a huge amount to be proud about, and we just have to make sure that everyone's walking the walk on whatever they decide to sing about. That's really interesting, and I love how you spent your gardening leave learning. That is really love impressive. It. Lots of learning, really, really, and and also I think that's so interesting from a agency leader and, and marketing leader perspective, because I think particularly when it comes to the climate crisis and sustainability, we don't always have all the answers straight away, which can maybe fuel like knee jerk campaigns rather than real long term sustainable um, changes in business, which are actually really, really exciting. And, and Becky, I'd love to get your view because we saw such a diverse range of work. There was so many memorable campaigns. I'd love to get your view. What what stood out in the work for you and what would you have liked to have seen more of? Yeah, absolutely. I just to sort of circle back on that point of, of, of purpose and everyone holding um, industry and brand to account. I think the UK in particular is such an interesting landscape for this at the moment. If we think about, you know, the, the swathe of, you know, uh, you know how active the SA has been in terms of uh, you know so, sort of um, 
following up on um, uh, some of the very very sensible and very active campaigning we've seen from um, climate change institutions. And obviously, again, like we're, we're in Europe, one of the leading areas in terms of um, regulating AI. So I think you're only going to see these two really interesting forces around greenwashing, around, um, uh, around AI regulation that are going to come and really sort of inform how we are holding brands to account on these on these sort of innovation tracks on these um claims that are being made in the sustainability space so it's I, i'm really excited for what the future holds particularly in the uk when it comes to sort of campaigning in those spaces and how mature we can be around you know uh real action real sustainable action real um concrete action that brands can take um in their creative campaigning because it's going to be driven by that sort of interface with the consumer um uh and and sort of the advertising and marketing forum um but yeah obviously you know major trends from what we saw in the work the industry still loves a great purpose you know we, we saw some really fantastic ones and served in really really interesting ways that felt really brand authentic which was um really really exciting to see it wasn't just sort of you know we're going to save the world we're gonna um we're gonna end uh climate change but i think one of the things that i really loved seeing was the sort of the breaking down of category boundaries so when you are engineering work around an action when you are engineering work around um a a genuine um a thing the brand can do in the world it really does break down those sort of like uh those facets and i remember us having discussions in the room and it was like is this is this in the right category because this feels like it should be over here here and over here and over here and i think that as someone who comes from an earned background as someone who comes from an agency that talks about sort of action being at the core of how you sort of participate and how you earn attention earn trust um i really really loved seeing that sort of level of brand action that we saw across the work more doing and then obviously the craft supporting that and landing that in 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 the right spaces and i think i think one of the things i would love to see more of is probably diversity of action so we saw a lot of these sort of like um uh taking uh, taking a sort of social good purposey campaign, tugging on the heartstrings a little bit, providing sort of a small scale solution. Um, but I'd love to see, you know, action doesn't just have to be purposey, like it can be irreverent, it can be silly, it can be playful, it can just be to see if we can. And um, I think there's there's definitely more of a role for for humor and playfulness. I, I think we've been talking about this for years, right? Like to, this is going to be the year when humor comes to the fore and wins can and wins everything. Um, still hasn't happened yet. But um, I think the work, some of the work that really resonated with the group was work that was just playful. Like there was Twix bears, there was Burger King's um, confusing times. Um, they felt really resonant from an insight perspective, from a sort of like where we're at culturally, where we're at socially, but they didn't really follow through from like an action point of view. So I think there's there's an opportunity to blend the two. There's an opportunity to see more in the world, see more doing in the world that um, feels more playful, feels more of the moment. Um, uh, yeah, not to neg on purpose because, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's important vital work and the social good category was so populated with exciting things going on um but it would be lovely it would be lovely to see a bit more of that kind of like uh i mean we saw it during covid we saw it during the start of the cost of living crisis we don't just want to see endless ads and marketing reels of you know we're there to support you like <laughs> through these through these challenging times it would be lovely to see more diversity more playfulness uh, more creativity in the way that we're sort of bringing that that tone to these campaigns so maybe who knows maybe next year is the year that humor is going to win <laughs> I think we could all do with a good laugh right now but I really <laughs> love <laughs> I loved how that Burger King confusing times campaign just really leaned into the uncomfortable nature of the consumer ecosystem that we find ourselves in today and and with those trends in mind there was also a, 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 a sort of nascent trend, I suppose, and perhaps in some cases it was, it looked like it was a bit of a bolt on, but it's definitely a space where we're having a big industry conversation about if we're all, you know, quite negative, if we're all going to be outsourced to robots, but actually AI has a huge potential to free us of all those admin tasks that eat our days to some degree. I mean, just what, what was your view? Do you think AI and new technology in the long term um, is going to be something that's a real part of the work or do you think that we're still at a space where it's CMO saying do something with we want something in AI or you know it's just kind of a bit of an, a creative afterthought? I don't think we have a choice I think you know technology <laughs> moves one way only, and that is forward 
And I think it is, um, it's almost like the tech industry has done a really good branding job of going, hey, AI is happening now, guys. So let's work out how that disrupts stuff and makes money in new places. Whereas the reality is that platforms, interfaces, experiences, you know, WhatsApp, auto text, we've been using AI for a very long time. I think it's now about, um, from a business perspective at least, working out how you scale that to meaningfully free up your human creative brains to do more of the good stuff. And it's going to take us longer than we'd like because everyone is, you know, scrabbling to do that. But ultimately, it should be a very, very brilliant thing. You know, you've seen polar different examples from some independents going, let's play around with what that could do uh, with creative responses. First past that, you see WPP working with the video, looking at sort of scaled um, AI content. Uh, you've got people using large language models as sort of uh, brain trusts and almost storage and to aggregate learnings. There are so many applications of it that we haven't got our heads around. But to my mind, the ultimate end game should be automate the stuff that we all want to be doing less of, please, which is repeating ourselves, forgetting what we did on the last pitch, not timesheets, we hate them, but you know, maybe that one can't be automated. Stuff that we don't have to do as our people ourselves. And then heaven forbid you would free up more actual time for our people to think, dream, create, and with a you know a different nucleus of an agency or a different shape of team, they'd be able to pay people better. I mean, all of these things should come from embracing technology to liberate our best creative selves. It's hilarious that the first thing that we've run to automate is, you know, like art and the act of creation. Yeah, right? like, Surely there are things to start with, you know, that we don't want <laughs> the handover wholesale to the machines. Yeah. Um, I think going back to your point on um, uh, some of the AI related work that we saw in the campaigning, like I think the bits that I enjoyed most were the bits that were almost clapping back at the, the, the cloud chasing, the buzz chasing around AI and um, uh, in chat GPT and so on and so forth. So I think the the we had a great debate, I know I was a big advocate for the, the Tuvalu first digital nation piece of work during that conversation. And I just, I, I think I've really enjoyed this year or maybe even the last couple of years really, seeing campaigns that are sort of uh, rerouting us in the role that digital is playing compared to, you know, very pressing issues that we've got on our plate as a society. So I think that's been really interesting. I'm really excited about seeing sort of more um more cynicism coming through <laughs> with some of those pieces of work as this sort of like hype cloud gets even gets even larger it's such an interesting hype cycle to follow but i love the idea and the promise of ai to really free up time and give people more freedom and an autonomy and ultimately more creativity and and i, I couldn't have this conversation without talking about some of the pressure points around time in our hybrid working world. Um, Jess, right at the beginning, you mentioned some of the all-in census findings. 33% of the industry are currently affected by stress and anxiety. So I'd love to have a bit of a discussion about what as organizations, but also as individuals, we should be doing differently. Because I have to say, it was just joyful spending a whole day in a room full of wonderful creative leaders. And you you, you sometimes leave things that you feel you don't have time for, feeling really recharged, renewed, and having learned a whole bunch of things. And, and I'd love to get a view from that because it feels like a perfect moment in time to talking about energy and how we preserve our energy. And just the all-in census says that Poor work-life balance is the second main reason people are looking to leave their company within the next 12 months. I hate the term balance. It's usually used as a stick to, to beat women with, but that's the term that they use in the census. I mean, how can companies really make a difference here? Yeah, it's like it's, um, it's a company thing. It's a human's relationship with time and a productivity thing. It's a societal thing when you look, we were talking just before this, weren't we, about, you know, rules in France around working hours and cultural differences in markets where, you know, you just do have a lull over a certain season when people just aren't working and if you make it work, then, then they're not necessarily less productive, committed, knowledgeable about what they're going to do at what point in their year. So I think there's, um, 
there's a sort of productivity trap that feels like we've all been a part of since the start of COVID and we came onto Teams and Nikki, you were saying at the start as well about that weird feeling you have 20 seconds into a Teams or Zoom meeting where you're like, how dare they be so late? But yet you swan into like a physical meeting like, sorry man, I just took like five hours not that, but nature break or whatever um, and that's just far more normal because people understand that the physical person you fall into an idea you're talking about or a, a, an empathy that takes you to a place in the conversation you just need to stop off on and you lose a bit of it like this um, so I think on the the time and flexibility thing I would say companies can't have a one size fits all to that I think a lot of companies have very admirably come out with well-being policies, you know, new thinking around working hours, all of that is to be applauded. Um, but I don't think you can, there's a risk with some of that when you do too much well-being allowance, you're almost assuming that work is going to be really hard <laughs> and really draining and not set up properly in the first place. So how do we get some of that joy and flexibility in how we work in the first place? Um, I think the one size fits one's really important. We've not talked a lot yet about intersectionality around sort of the female um the female group god i'm a woman why am i saying this like this um so we, so it's different right it's different based on your individual needs are you a person a woman with caring responsibilities who comes who is white not white comes from a different cultural background um has a different home set up and responsibilities all of these things need looking at so unfortunately i think my answer is that it's complicated and you have to do work and so one of my big things about wanting to join Dentsu is that we work with official industry or beyond expert partners on specific areas. So with visibility on our reasonable adjustments for disability, with 55 refined on age inclusion, with earlier careers, on social mobility and recruitment and, and so on. And I think you kind of have to do that to make sure that you are catering for everybody's difference. You can't just go have a do they day or don't worry our all in days are only two or three because that doesn't necessarily mean people are logging off when they should or looking after themselves um and the only thing, other thing i'd say on that is that i'm saying this from an agency perspective as i know becky is as well is that you know we are we serve brands we who are our clients and so none of this can actually really change unless you start the conversations there we can write mantras and manifestos all we like but unless we're starting with our individual really key brand partners and saying how can we set a commitment to really look after each other that's you know it, it's it's not going to change and clients today are more worried than ever about protecting that brain trust in their agency partners so everyone is invested in looking after the people behind the work so i think start there and, and you've got to do all the different bits that's really interesting and i think it's actually really a credit to say how complicated it is because I think perhaps looking at the differences as to how agencies and some brands have approached this solution, it feels like some agencies have branded, have jumped to a branded solution to the future of work. Whereas when you talk to a lot of CMOs, they're talking very much about how do we build a culture of creativity and curiosity in a hybrid world? How do we, how do we do that? They're still asking the questions and tackling the complication and the confusion rather than saying here's my neatly branded solution to a really really complex issue and and Becky I'd, I'd love to bring you in here because there were other statistics in the all-in census and you know we've we've just come off far too many headlines about the great resignation now we've got the great regret we've always got a good headline on the go but ultimately um Advertising is a people-focused business. You know, clients buy agency brands, but they also really buy people. And I'd love to get your view. Do you think that the industry is doing enough to retain women? I think brutally and generally, no. <laughs> but I mean, don't get me wrong. Like there is, there are obviously pockets of great innovation out there and great flexibility. Um, my own agency rolled out a menopause policy, I think it was about two years ago now, that included 10 days um, 10 paid days of leave and that was considered sort of groundbreaking at the time uh, but obviously things have moved on substantially since that point that point and that moment in time and I think a lot of the, the conversations that we have around retaining and progressing women they start from a very sort of like uh, fix the women uh, perspective um, uh, to you know use the parlance uh, 
of, of, of Laura Bates, an incredible author. Uh, but I, I guess I'd love to see more being done to fix the system, just generally speaking. And I think that's that's where you see great agencies thrive because they have done the work to work with independent partners, work with um, all of these, uh, these expert and consultants to understand the systemic challenges that women face within the workplace rather than just sort of, you know, get out there and network more or you know get on a panel or whatever it might be to sort of like um tackle that issue of profile um so I, I think you know there's a couple of headlines right there's maternity we still don't see enough being done around paternity leave to allow people to you know truly uh share that load um I come from a very privileged position as a childless queer woman so but that's something I recognize in all of my teams it's really really difficult when you know even if we've got the best maternity policies in the world that doesn't cover all the shortfalls of a general societal system that doesn't support women um, as primary care caregivers in the way that it should um on flexible working I think like we made huge ground over over COVID um but obviously in tough economic circumstances we've really seen a rollback of that in recent times and I think that speaks to your point about confusion and neatly branded packages so there what I don't think there's enough comfort to sit in the confusion and, and say sort of we don't necessarily have the right solution yet um so you've seen this flip-flop this you know we'll go full, full flexible but no oh no we're not seeing the results so we're all come back to five days in the week I think we need to learn to sit in that discomfort and work out what's right for different people um and you know and as people are sort of walking that flexibility back, that really does impact women first and foremost as those primary caregivers, um, you know, they're dependent on flexibility. I say they, we are dependent on flexibility uh, to participate fully in the workforce um, uh, in a way that sort of, you know, uh, benefits the economy, benefits our agencies, benefits the work um, in the way that it does. Um, and obviously women, we know, were unfairly penalized during COVID, you know, taking the larger proportion of, of of uh, furlough of resignations and um, of you know care responsibilities so if we if we begin to roll back those small gains that we made in flexible working um in and that helped us towards a slightly more equitable workforce um there you know we're really onto a losing streak for retaining women um in that workforce and um, I think obviously the, the the unspoken component here is also around mentoring and platforming. You know, we've got a huge responsibility to make sure that that is something that is embedded as a system rather than just beholden on women to go out and build their own networks, find their own mentors and secure their own position. Um, and I think in my career, I've definitely sort of identified individuals that have helped me do that, but not systems that have helped me do that. Um, so I'd really love to see more senior men passing the mic. Um, uh, there's been great stories, haven't there? Like Alexis um, uh, uh, Ohanian, the Reddit co-founder, who uh, who resigned in sort of the height of Black Lives Matter movement um, and urged the board to give his seat to a Black person. I think those are really interesting. Like, that's obviously a, a very punchy, very pr move, but it's really interesting to, for people to recognize the responsibility they have in building the cultures and systems that they desire in the workplace that we all share um so yeah stop talking about culture fits stop hiring from the bro code and then we'll we'll be in a a, a stronger position there and obviously like you know, women should shout about their achievements. I'm not saying like, don't go out there and don't do lean into the work and, you know, lean into those those opportunities. I want to hear about all of them. I want to celebrate all of you. Um, but I think we need to change the lens of that discussion as much as we do the lens um, around the work. That's such an interesting point, and particularly in the discussions surrounding overwhelm, because often you'll have um, particular groups that are responsible for solving problems that they're also disproportionately impacted by. And I think that's a really interesting point um, about um, this being a job for everybody. Um, and with jobs in mind, we do have summer coming. I, I know I'm saying that like it's a real threat. It's almost a decade since Beach Body Ready. I should be more like happy about summer, not as a job to do, but as a lovely time of year to actually really embrace that back to school mentality and really think about what we can do as individuals to keep creative, to actually have those moments where you've got space for those uncomfortable conversations, that ability to sit in discomfort. I sometimes feel like we're in such a rush all the time that perhaps we don't give ourselves the time to really 
look and learn at the work. And it was one of the things that I really personally appreciate about the Garrity Awards is just that ability to just sit amongst so many talented women and just listen to them. So I'd love to get just a bit of a closing tip for the audience, because it is such a privilege to judge so much work, even work you hate, you still learn something from. But what one small thing are you doing differently to give yourself that space and permission to be creative this summer that perhaps our audience could steal? And Jess, could I put you on the spot first, please? Okay. Um, this is very personal because it's, um, you know, I'm a few weeks into this new gig and I think it's it's different things for different moments, right? So one summer coming up, just going, actually, what a beautiful thing that all of my teams are going to have a holiday and a much needed rest. And we're all going to get a bit of headspace and a bit of an emotional reset before we charge into what feels like the new year in September. Um I also think if, you know, we all wake up different people and go, oh my God, my head is busy. Oh my God, my head is needs inspiration. And so if it's a need inspiration, need stuff going on, go and see something that fills your heart with joy, you know, spend time with the work, but, you know, go to gallery. I was in Barcelona about a month or so ago and got to see you know, some amazing, really experiential art mixed with music, just stuff that makes your heart sort of sing and makes you just after the fact, even a week after, just go, oh man. And looking at stuff with new eyes most of the time head way too busy and just need to just ground yourself I live in Walthamstow by Epping Forest so I normally just go like a weird person and take my shoes and socks off and run around with my boys so um that's my other go-to tip which is just go have a tree I love that <laughs> thank you and and Becky what's your advice um it's probably all along similar lines but I guess um I've uh, re the rest is not passive I think is like the thing that I try and remember because um if rest for you is just turning off fr from the work or turning off from uh you know whatever's going on it it's not filling your cup it's not filling your creativity it's not filling your personhood <laughs> because you are you're not an automata that gets stuck in the cupboard when when the work day is done uh, you're a whole human believe it or not um, and and rest i think as jess was talking about it should be that thing that that brings you joy that brings you peace that brings you connection um it's not just that kind of like pause button before work resumes again and um we remember that in the summer we remember that you know that rest is active, rest is this, doing these things that go and fill us with peace and joy and all of those wonderful things. But we forget that all too often through the rest of the year and we treat rest like a pause. We we treat rest just like a, a moment to stop. And it's not um, just like, you know, just like fitness or exercise is the rest that gives you, or it gives you energy to, you know, to go and do it again. It's self-fulfilling. Like the more that you do it, the more energy you have. I think rest that fulfills you it, it is going to give you that energy to be able to continue through and, and make you less um, drained throughout the year. There's, there's an amazing um, uh, speaker and activist on the, to the topic of, of rest as rebellion. Um, and it's sort of like a reclaim from, uh, uh, well, let's not get too far into capitalistic systems and, and the breakdown of all of that right now, but um, uh, called the Nat Ministry on Instagram. And I think they just have such inspiring content about, um, you know, yeah, rest being part of you as a person rather than just the switch off I love that that's such good advice I think active rest can be something that's really really interesting and I do think sometimes rest does feel like quite a radical act um so that's a, a lovely point to end on um thank you both so much for taking the time to talk us through some of the work that's really made a difference over the past 12 months um you've left us with loads of things to think about um, not least um, the importance of sitting in discomfort, the action of learning, particularly when it comes to the climate crisis. Um, and just also just the brilliance that happens when people come together and have a proper conversation and debate. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. And thank you to the Garrity Awards for partnering with us at Creative Brief um, for this judging panel. Thank you.